Hey, why don't you join me in the book of 1 Kings, man? I believe the Word of God is going to touch your life this morning. I believe God's going to increase you and encourage you today. I just believe that. I'm anticipating what the Lord's going to do. Now, I'm going to preach different today because I just... Uh, I, I got these, these passages of Scripture, and I want to just kind of preach through them a little bit. I'm not going to pre- read all the way to the end because it's fairly lengthy today. But there's nuggets in the midst of what I'm about to read, so it's probably going to be a little bit harder to take notes today, and I know it's going to be harder to follow me in the media team, but you guys are incredible and awesome, and I know that you'll do a fantastic job. You always do. 1 Kings chapter number 18. If you're there, say amen. If you're not, say hold on a second. All right, most of you are there. I love, it. I love the first three words, and it came to pass. You ever had to encourage yourself with just those, those few words right there? Didn't come to stay, came to pass. All, there's been many times in my life I've had to encourage myself there. But that was a little bit I wanted to preach on. It just kind of jumped out at me that right now that says that. But anyway, it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go present yourself to Ahab. Now, many of you know about this king, this guy named Ahab. He was noted as one of the wicked kings of Israel. He was most noted that he married a, some crazy lady from a foreign land that really was, uh, uh, you know, wanted to lead the nation of Israel herself. But something that you may not have known is that Ahab is the seventh king in the nation of Israel. And I happen to believe that numbers in the scripture mean something. Now, I'm not into numerology like some folks are that every single number has something to do prophetically with some futuristic event. I, I'm not that guy, but I do believe that numbers matter. I believe that they do matter, and y- you know that I've used numbers before. Him being the seventh king, I know that the number seven is God's number of completion. Seven days, he made the... He made this world in, in, that, in that period of time. And you would think that in that, him being the seventh king that something might have clicked in his mind to maybe totally shift him to a place where he could understand his significance, his role. I mean, after all, he is a king of a nation. After all, he is a king not of just any nation, but a nation that God favors. Not just any nation that God favors, but the one that God has given his law to and shown his goodness to and given miracle signs and wonders to, fed them miraculously in their journeys in the wilderness. He, he, he opened water wells for them. He, un, he, he did so many things, and I don't have time to go through all of the miracles that God had done for the nation, but maybe somehow you would think, man, here I am. I'm on God's number. I'm on God's number, you know. He created seven days... In a week, he, he, he just did all of these things so phenomenally. I should be able to grasp what God is doing in my life, but he missed it. He missed his moment. You know, you hear me say this, and I'm not the first one that said it, but that a moment, you have to seize a moment within the opportunity or the window of that moment or it'll pass you by. He had only a few years to be able to... to uh, to be the king, and I'm not, I don't mean three, but a short stint to be able to be a king and represent God and make a difference and make a difference in a, in a, in a, in a world that is hopeless and dark. But instead of seizing that moment, he decided to go a different ra- way. He missed his moment by marrying some heathen lady. I mean, you know, you can hook your wagon to somebody that will lead you in the wrong direction. I've seen many good, godly young men and women come up in church and serve God and be filled with the Spirit, dance around the altar, anointed of God, praying for people, doing a lot of things, and then all of a sudden they meet her. Or all of a sudden they meet him. And then when they do that, all of a sudden this life that was supposed to have great significance and just shine with the glory of God now is off track. And, and, and their lives, man, it, it wasn't anything like maybe God had intended in the beginning. Because, you know, we're, we're told not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Did you know that? Did you know the Bible said that? And sometimes we in the modern church have a hard time understanding what that actually means. 
I think it means just as simple as it says. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Don't be yoking yourself up. Don't be linking yourself up with somebody that you're not intended to be. Because it will lead you down a path and a life of hurt and disconnect from God. And life is hard enough in and of itself. And marriage is hard enough in itself. Even if both of you are seeking God. Because there's a devil that wants to destroy you. Can you say amen? amen. And you don't need to add to it that somebody doesn't have a heart to want to seek God. And go after God with all that's within them. You don't want to, you, you don't want to do that. You're not going to complete the will of God. And here with this man, this incredible opportunity that is he's, he's a king of a nation, God's nation, God's people. He had a chance to show forth the glory and the goodness of God, but instead of doing that, he, he hooks up with this, this, and I hate to be disrespectful, but this chick that was just really off. Uh, man, he, he, he was, you know, he, and, and here's another thing. His name, th his name means uh, and, and, and this is a misidentification as well. This, maybe this is the key. His name means the father's brother. Maybe in his mind, rather than understanding that I'm the father's son, he elevated himself in his mind that he was the father's brother. Maybe he elevated in his mind that somehow God... You know, God's not that significant in my life because after all, I'm the king. <laughs> after all, look at my significance. I mean, if I really needed God, I'm, I, my intelligence got me here. My hard work and commitment got me here. And I'm not against intellect and I'm not against hard work. But I'm just saying, don't forget who gave you that brain. Don't forget who gave you those muscles and that ability. Don't forget who gave you the ability to do what you can do. And here's this man, you know, maybe he was trying to live up to his name. and Maybe he was misidentified. How many times have you ever been misidentified? Miss Paula and I were having a conversation this week in the office. And I said, one of the things that bothered me in the headings of scriptures, of Bibles, I shouldn't say of scripture, of Bibles. Now, I want to be careful right here because I need you to hear me. Original writings did not have chapter and verse and did not have the headings that your and my Bible have in them. And so if you want to find a particular story in the Bible, a lot of times you might not know the, the, the actual location, but you might know the book, and maybe you'll get in the book of Matthew and you start flipping through, and instead of reading every one, you're looking at those headings. And sometimes, I don't know what got into the mind, the heart, the thought process of those Bible translators that decided, I'm going to just put a heading right here that makes this easy to find. And they put headings like, Blind Bartimaeus. Wait a minute. When I read that story, I don't see a blind Bartimaeus. I see a seeing Bartimaeus after Jesus got done with him. But the problem is, is that everybody else wants to identify you with your old issue. Somebody wants to misidentify you. Therefore, when people are looking for your significance, they look back at a title that wasn't supposed to be yours in the beginning. You only had the blind eyes so that he could walk by and say, See now, open those eyes. Can you say amen? Or it will say woman with the issue of blood. Just so that they could refer back to her as this woman with an issue. And maybe if you look at this guy's life, Ahab's life, maybe he's only trying to live up to his name. I, maybe that's a sentiment that I might give him. But at the same time, at the same time, the right identity will, will, will help you a lot. If, did you ever notice when Jesus started his ministry? After a word of significant identity. So Jesus, he goes to be baptized by John in the River Jordan. And when he's baptized, oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. When he's baptized and comes up, you know what he hears? A voice comes from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. An identity from the Father released upon a Son launched him in three years of transformational ministry. And all I want to say to us sometimes is that a word released over your life and an identity given to you, not as a victor, but a, a victim, but a victor, not as a failure, but a success in God, not as one that was mis that misidentified by your last mistake, but by the mercy of God that forgave you. And if you stand in that identity, it can launch you forth in something that you never could have imagined. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Aren't you glad that you don't have your old identity? I mean, people try to keep it on you. Can you, you know they do. 
How many are glad that God does it? Come on, he made you not foreigners and not distant, but friends, sons and daughters. Can you say amen to that? And because you have that sonship, you have access. Because you have that, that, that kinderness with God, you have great access. But the world will want to keep you in a false identity. And maybe Ahab, with his false identity, made him believe that he didn't have to hear God. He can make it through life without God. He can make it through his, because after all, he came from good stock. How many know it doesn't matter who your daddy is? Doesn't matter who your mama is? Doesn't matter who is who in the crazy zoo of the world? I, come on, somebody. It may get you access in some places, but it also may build a mentality in you that causes you not to depend on God when you really need to depend on God every day of your life. You might lean up on somebody else's name and you might lean up on somebody else's gift and you might lean up on somebody else's stuff, but I know that'll let you down. If you can lean upon the goodness of God, if you can lean upon the identity that God's given you, if you can lean upon your identity as a son or a daughter of the living God, and if you can rest assured in that and you can stand in that and you can say when you go into the throne room of God, God, I come to you today in the name of Jesus as a son of the living God. You made me a son, and I believe he's a daddy with loving ears that says, come right on in, boy. Get up on my lap. Get up on my lap, daughter, and let's talk about your life. You are identified as a son. That's why I said I made you more than a conqueror. That's why I said I made you an overcomer. That's why I said that nothing, nothing shall be able to withstand you because you're my child. But maybe he had his idea, but my daddy is Omri. My dad is the former king. I don't have time to go into Omri's name, but that was good preaching right there. So he said, and I will send rain on the earth. Uh, so Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. And so God had spoke to Isaiah to, or uh, Elijah to prophesy of a, 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 an extreme drought. Uh, how many know disobedience to God can bring extreme drought? I don't have time to go into why I think we face the things we face as a country. I will just simply say this. When you start forgetting God, you start walking away from God. It's not karma, honey. It's planting, sowing, and reaping. You know what I'm saying? Some people think that's the same thing as though karma is an energy. No, it, li listen to me. That's, that's religion's way to try to, uh, to, to give a title to God's spiritual law that says whatsoever a man sows. Okay, so that's, that's religion's attempt to put a title to a function of God so that we don't have to identify if I'll get my life right with God and sow into the seeds of the goodness of God, I can reap God's stuff. So we like to name it karma so that we don't have to depend upon the God of purpose so that we feel better about ourselves and not have to rely on him. That was free, and it was good. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So there's a famine in the land. And, uh, and so what happens is, is so Elijah um, would present himself to Ahab. There was a severe famine in the land, and Ahab had called Obadiah. Obadiah is one of his buddies, but he's, he's working for the king. And Obadiah's name means servant of the Lord. Servant of the Lord. How many of you know people, if you're a servant of God, God will give you some favor. I mean, here's a jacked up, messed up, manipulated king, but he's got a guy working in his court named servant of the Lord. And because he's a servant of the Lord, and, and you'll read in just a minute actually what he done when, when, when Ahab's wife is going nuts, Jezebel, and she's killing the prophets of God. Obadiah, the servant of God, says, in the midst of a famine, listen, in the midst of a famine, we're going to read in just a minute how Ahab is just looking for a little bit of water that hopefully some grass is growing somewhere to feed some of the animals that are left that have not died yet because of the severity of the famine. Here is a man, a servant of God, in the king's court, in the king's home, that decides, 
I'm going to go save as many prophets as I can. And he gets a hundred of them. And he hides 50 in this cave and 50 in that cave and he feeds them bread and water. We could preach on Jesus right there about the living bread and the water and the multiplication of the gift, the power of God in the, in the parable of have them sit down in groups of 50. What was being overshadowed when Obad, Obadiah works here. <laughs> oh, there's so much I could talk to you about right there because it, there's always a prediction of who, the, who, who, who will, who will uh, come, you know, uh, who, who, who would come, that, 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 that the spirit of Elijah would come uh, and rest up on the forerunner of Christ. And he says, Elijah has come in John the Baptist. Oh, there's so much good right there. There's so much good right there because of the work and the time frame of Elijah and the prophetic meaning of what was happening with Obadiah's life, the servant of God, Jesus being the servant, the one who took the 50 and gave him bread. But oh, if you, I love the Bible. I just love the Word of God. Man, I just love the Scriptures. On Easter, we're going re- to start a, a series called The Word Works. And I'm just telling you, that book that the devil's told you is hard to read, that book that's, that, that the devil tries his very best to keep you from it, it, it adapting into your life, that book that the enemy tries his very best to keep you away from is really your answer to life. And this whole Easter season is about the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. So, man, I love the Bible. We could get into so much right there, but you need to understand, his name is called the servant of the Lord. Listen to me. I, here's why I want to give this to you today right now, this portion. I'm not talking about an arrogance. I'm not talking about an entitlement. But you should have the mentality that because I'm a servant of the Lord, God will favor me if I step out in faith. Can you imagine? He knows that if he gets caught, it's going to be his life. He knows that if anything is uttered that these 100 prophets has been hid away by him, he'll lose his life. But the reward was better than the risk for him to serve God. And so he serves God and God elevates him to such a place that Ahab's now dependent on him. Let's finish some more of this story. This is incredible. And so, uh, and Ahab had called Obadiah, who was in charge of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for uh, for so it was while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah had taken 100 of the prophets and hid them, 50 in a cave, and he fed them with bread and water. I love this. Even a famine won't keep resources from a servant of God. You, you check that out. Did you, did you miss that? I mean, the king, the king is trying to find water, man. And here, here's one of the servants in his house says, I got enough water to, feed, to, water, to give water to 100, 100, 100 prophets. I got enough bread to give to 100 prophets. Mm. Oh, goodness, help me, Jesus. Uh, and so, and, and, and the Bible says, And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go into the land all the springs of water and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass and, uh, to keep the horses and mules alive so that we will not have to kill any livestock. So they divided, in the land, or they divided the land between them to explore it. Ahab went one way himself, by himself and Obadiah went another way by himself. Now Obadiah was, one, was on his way and suddenly Elijah... Elijah, you know what Elijah's name means? God is Jehovah. That means sometimes, sometimes when you're just doing your very best to honor and serve the Lord, and you're just being a faithful servant of God, God encounters are coming your way. Huh? God encounters are coming your way. Yeah, they might come through a man named Elijah, or they might come through a man named Anthony, or might through a man named Michael, or a lady named Carla, or it might be through a woman named Margaret, or it might be through somebody else. But another servant of God has been divinely appointed to cross paths with your life, and at that moment to help reveal the goodness of who God really is, the revelation of Jehovah, the revelation of this covenantal God that loves you so 
much. And that's why meeting in church is so important. That's why I'm doing what we're doing right now is so important so that maybe God might would use my life in some little way to help you to have a better, clearer picture of who your God really is. He is a way-making God. He is a favorable God. He is a covenantial God. He's a grace-filled God. Yeah, I'm doing a little bit of cheerleading this morning, but I believe it's time that we stop hearing all the bad news and start listening to some good news. You look at Fox CNN and MSNBC and all the others, all they've got is bad news and terrible things and the world's going to hell in a handbasket and our Lord said it would. But the good news is is that God became man, stepped into our world and said, I want to find me some people that I can get in relationship with and reveal my goodness to, show myself strong on behalf of. Yeah, that's who he is, and he's my God, and he's your God, and we sung about his goodness earlier. We talked about his faithfulness. That's why we lift our hands, and that's why we lift our voices. That's why we shout, jump, dance, get loud, because there's no God like Jehovah. Uh, behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee for out of Zion's hill salvation. Come. Yeah, it's Jehovah. It's the God Almighty, the one who was and is and is to come, the one who spoke and the foundations of the world existed, the one who said, I will go down and get among them so that I can have relationship with them. I'm about to preach myself happy here. <laughs> Yeah, suddenly Elijah met him, and he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is that you, my Lord Elijah? And, and he answered him. I love this man's respect. I mean, I, you, you just look at him. No wonder the Lord has protected him. No wonder the Lord has favored this man, Obadiah, like he has even in the midst of harsh leadership. Come on, somebody. Listen to me. Your boss doesn't have to get kinder to you for you to get favor on your job. He'll favor you and not even know why. <laughs> yeah, if, if you'll serve, come on somebody. If you'll honor God, if you'll walk in the integrity of the goodness of the Lord, huh? and, 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 and just notice his posture. He sees this man of God and he's just, and he's calling him my Lord. I mean, I mean you know, and, and I get it. It was, a, it was a cultural thing for places of great honor and respect and renown, especially among the brethren of the Lord. People who had identificational uh, uh, callings on their life, such as Elijah the prophet. When somebody met a prophet like that, their posture was, it, it was, it was extremely reverent. Extremely, and, and, and we've lost honor in our culture. We've, we've almost all but lost honor in our culture. We don't, like, like, like you can name a president, whether Democrat or Republican, and there's people will no longer honor the office. And then we wonder why so much dysfunction is among us. <laughs> I tell you why, because God placed a system of honor that under that system of honor he'll always bless. Huh? Huh? He never removed it. He actually even said, hey, those that minister in the word among you, they're worthy of double honor. You need to watch that. You understand? This is not to elevate preachers. This, that's not what it's about. It's about honoring the God who gives the preacher as a gift to help you to see Jehovah better. To, to, to get you engaged in the ministry of, of the kingdom. So, so when you honor stuff like that, the Holy Spirit gets in that. The Holy Spirit gets in that and does some incredible things. And here's this man. He, you see the posture of his heart. Posture of his heart. He's honoring this guy. And I look at things like this and I think to myself, man, God, just give me that kind of heart. Give me that kind of heart to just understand that, to, to, to be able to honor folks. Honor their calling. Honor who they are. Honor their, their purpose in the kingdom. Honor, just, 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 a, just a heart of honor. And, I, and I'm praying for that. I'm asking the Lord for more of that. Come on, is anybody asking the Lord for more? I mean, if you're asking the Lord for more, then learn a principle here, a principle of honor. If you'll learn a principle of honor, God says, remember, remember I talked to you, when we get into our series on maturity, we'll talk about honor some in, in that arena. 
because it, it's, it's in that. Uh, listen, honor is not what someone deserves. It's a standard of your heart. Because we all have lived in ways that do not deserve honor. Hello, somebody. I got my hand up first. We all have. But if, if that's how we give honor, you won't ever be a person of honor. You'll always find an excuse to dishonor. But if the principle of honor is in your heart, you honor first, and God says that's maturity. His willingness, now he's, go, he's going to tell the story, if I go, we'll read it in a second, he said, but if I go to Ahab, because Elijah's going to tell him to go to Ahab, and he says, if I go to Ahab, he's, and he, I tell him you're alive, he's going to kill me. Then he turns around and goes to Ahab, and Ahab doesn't kill him. I believe the difference would, is because of the way he honored the announcement from the prophet of what was about to happen. So that's just my personal belief. So let's read a little farther. If I can remember where I was. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, yeah, that'd be great if I had mine on numbers up here, but I do not. <laughs> so Obadiah greatly, let me, let me just start right here. So uh, now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For so it was while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah Took 100 of the prophets. Boy, I really backed up there, didn't I? 100 of the prophets. But it's the word of God. It's still living, right? <laughs> oh, take it 100 of the prophets and hid them 50 in a cave. I'll do better here in a minute. Y'all pray for me. Um, and, and he fed them with bread and water. And, uh, and Ahab said to Obadiah, Go into the land, to the springs, and to the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass to keep the, our horses and mules alive. So it was while they... Uh, uh, so that we will not have to kill any of the livestock. So they divided the land between them to explore it. Ahab went one way and Obadiah went another way uh, by himself. Now Obadiah was on his way and he suddenly uh, Elijah met him and he recognized him, fell on his face, there's where he was, that, uh, is that you, my Lord Elijah? And he answered and said, it is I. Go tell your master Elijah is here. Well, that's some confidence right there, isn't it? Go tell your master that Elijah is here. So he said, how have I sinned that you, have, you are delivering your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not uh, took an oath from the kingdom and, or nation that they could not find you. And now you say, go tell your master Elijah is here and... And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from you that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you away. I love this. You, you know why I love this? Because this is really cool. I think this is awesome. So Ahab has been seeking after Elijah to kill him. But the Spirit of the Lord keeps telling Elijah, hey, Ahab's coming here. Don't go into that town. Do this. Go, go rest here. I'm going to take you out in the wilderness. I'm going to give you some, you know, I, I'm going to take care of you. And Obadiah knows that. He's like, if I go tell him that you're here, while I go tell him the Holy Spirit's going to take you somewhere else, and I'm a dead man. I, I'm a dead man. Oh, don't you love the Holy Spirit? Don't you love the work of the Holy Spirit? Not to play games with <laughs> Ahab, per se, but to direct your life. Do you know you are in a spirit-filled church that expresses how important it is for you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, a language from heaven that you and the Father can communicate on a level that you can't communicate in any other circle of life with? That you can communicate with God and God can communicate and impress your heart and do some things and give you some specific instructions? And we're, you know, as time goes on and people gets all wigged out about this person speaking in tongues or this one falling to the floor, this one doing this, this one shouting, doing that. Don't get mixed up in all of those types of manifestations. Just hear me when I say, the closer you get to God and the more filled you get with the Holy Spirit, the better the direction that you can get from God to direct your life that when the enemy seeks to steal, kill, and to destroy, you can avert it. Hey, amen, you can avert it. 
And sometimes he'll walk you right in the middle of it. Obviously, the Holy Spirit is leading him right in the middle of it, but it'll be an on-time moment. Can you say amen? It'll be an on-time moment for somebody to have an encounter with God because this is that great story that we love to preach about because in a few minutes, we're going to skip past it today, but this is, the sto- this is the chapter where Elijah slays the prophets of Baal. This is where he calls fire down from heaven. That's our Pentecostal message, right? Calling fire down from heaven and licking up the water that is in the trough. And when he, how he makes fun of the prophets of Baal when he says, well, maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe you're going to have to try this a little bit more. Cut yourself a little bit harder. I'm not sure he's really listening. But then it comes his time, the time of the evening sacrifice. And he calls upon the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Bible says that God answers by fire because he had already said, let the God that answers by fire let him be God no wonder we talk about the Holy Spirit because Jesus John the Baptist said when Jesus comes he'd baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire come on somebody no wonder that when they were in the upper room in Acts chapter 2 that the spirit begins to descend and something cloven tongues like as of fire set upon them because he's still the God that answers by yeah fire he's still the God that answers by fire And that's what I'm talking about, the fire of the Holy Spirit, not just so you can speak in tongues, not so you can shout, quake, or dance, but so that you can have intimacy with Father on another level whereby instruction can come to your life and direction can come to your life and power can come for your life. Why? So you can get through stuff? Why? So you can make it through this life? No, so that you can show forth the Jesus who lives in you. Huh? Yeah, that Jesus who lives in you that said lay hands on this. Oh, come on, somebody. That Jesus that lives inside of you that said no weapon. Oh, This is good preaching today. I'm just telling you right now. Help me, Lord. It's not good for taking notes, but it's, 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 it's great. I'm feeling better anyway. And so he's led by the Spirit. So he says, so when I go and tell Ahab, he can't find you who'll kill me. But I, your servant, have, has, has feared the Lord uh, from my youth. Uh, was it not reported to my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid 100 of the men of the Lord, the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave, and fed them with water and bread, or bread and water? And now you say, go and tell your master, Elijah, is here. Oh, man, sometimes God's going to ask you to do stuff that just don't make sense. Huh? I mean, how many times has the Lord shifted stuff in your life and you're just like, that just don't make sense right now? We feel better if we can make sense of it. The problem with that is, is the more we make sense of it, the less we can faith in it. Um, and it's faith that pleases God. Now, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to propagate ignorance here. What I am, because ignorance is not looking at the facts, okay? But facts, or facts is only subject to truth. When truth is superior to facts, facts has to bow down. So facts may say that a woman... A virgin can't have a baby. But the truth is that the Holy Spirit came upon a little virgin girl and she conceived and brought forth a son and his name was Emmanuel, God with us. Facts have to bow down to truth. And the more we feel like we can understand, the more fear... Notice what he's doing. The more he recites this, terror is getting in his heart. He's a servant of God. He loves the Lord, but he's reciting this. If I, if this plays out like you want this to play out, bro, this is not going to go well. I'm going to die. I'm going to lose my life. And, and it's almost like at that, those very critical moments that the enemy is really pulling at his heart. The enemy is really pulling at him to get into this mindset that what is about to shift is going to create a problem for him. And shifts that happen, though you don't understand them, are not intended to create problems for you. 
but an opportunity for you to grasp a promise. A promise from a God that said he'd never leave you or forsake you. Hello. A promise from God. You know, the Bible says all of the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yes and amen. If you could ever just do a study of the promises of God and know that in Jesus Christ you have access to them, we would struggle to ever have days of, of, of just utter hopelessness. Because we don't know the promises, the enemy starts using facts to destroy our thinking. And we start getting into carnality instead of faith to believe that the promise is for me and access is for me. God's faithfulness is to me so that we'll get into, we'll play right in. Can I just say this? I'm going to preach about this here not too long from now too. There's a, one major thing that, that human beings are in. We are in a suspended place between uh, God's heaven and this earthly reality. But there is another reality called hell, a place that God has prepared for Satan and his angels. Hello. In our participation with hell, we can bring hell up. Or in our participation with heaven, we can pull heaven down. That's why Jesus told you when you pray, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Adam's original intent was to bring heaven's experience to an earthly reality by his constant communion with an almighty God. You have the potential to pull heaven down through faith or pull heaven up through, or hell up through participation with it. So the culture of hell is not forgiveness. The devil will never be forgiven. When you walk in unforgiveness, you know what you're pulling up? The culture of hell. Y'all don't have time for that right now. We, 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 y'all, y'all will do that in another day. We'll do, we'll do that in another day, I promise. We'll get to that. So understand, when you participate with the culture of hell, that's why your Bible is so important, because it will tell you about the culture of heaven. And when you participate with the culture of heaven, guess what you do? You pull heaven's experiences into your reality. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Show me your ways. Teach me your word. Oh, God, teach me your word. Can you say amen to that? All right, all right, all right. He said, but you, let me see where I was. I'm, I'm, I'm getting mixed up again. Anyway, anyway, let me, let me start right here. He will kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord lives, the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, he will, he, he, uh, I will surely present myself to him today. Uh, God, God, look, oh, God, give us people that will stand in the will of God. That's my note right behind that. God, just give us people that will stand in the will of God. Lord, just give us people that will stand in the will of God. Because, listen, he's already had the story. Man, this man's been seeking you in every city and in every kingdom you've ever been in. In case you didn't know that, Obadiah is telling him. Obadiah is telling him. My, my master has sought you in every city. And he says, tell him I'm here, and I ain't moving. Oh, God, give us some people that has the tenacity. I'm here, and I'm not moving. I'm here, and I'm not packing my bags. I'm here because God has planted. I'm here because this is what God's told me to do. I'm in this job because that's what the Lord's told me to do. Come on, somebody. I, I, I'm doing this because that's what the Lord told me to. I'm starting this new ministry because that's what the Lord told me to do. And, and all of the threats can't back me down. Can you say amen to that? Amen. God, give us some people that will stand. You know, and, and listen to me. We live in a day and time. Oh, God, give us a church that will stand. Come on, somebody. Oh, God, give us a church that will stand. Uh, yeah, yeah, praise the Lord. So Obadiah went and met Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Now it happened when Ahab saw Elijah uh, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? <laughs> Isn't it funny how the world thinks we're the problem? I mean, we're preaching grace. We're preaching love. We're preaching truth. You know what? They don't have a problem with your grace, your love, and your... your well, I shouldn't say truth. They don't have a problem with your grace. They don't have a problem with your love, but they have a problem with your truth. Yeah, they have a problem with the truth of God. It's not in the... Listen, they don't have a problem with forgiveness. 
Bring it on. We need to forgive everybody. They kind of mean that. Br bring it on. All the grace we can get, all the love we can get, send some love my way. Send prayers my way. Send, send some good thoughts and energy my way. People that post that wig me out. Send some energy my way. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Send energy your way. Yeah, give me a good vibe. Only when I know it's good, 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 good vibrations. I need to know good vibrations. That's the only one I know. And that even predates me, that song. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, the Beast Boys, I think it was. Anyway, anyway, uh, I don't even know what that means. But, but people will embrace what they think is the good side of God. They don't want what they see as the restrictive side of God. The God that says, here's what marriage looks like. Here's what family looks like. Here's what righteousness looks like. Here's what truth looks like. No, no, no. We reject God on that premise. We, we reject the things of God. And those of you that preach it, you're the problem. You're the hater. You're the bigot. You're the one that's dividing this country. You're the one that we all need to get rid of. We want to cancel you. Yeah. And they're trying harder and harder and harder and harder. It's funny how the world sees us as the problem, but honestly, God's solution to the world was his son, Jesus Christ. And the proclamation of that truth comes through what is called the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. I love something. When they were at Wild Ones Conference, I don't know if you caught that, what was, was being said over those teenagers, but I caught it and it landed heavy with me. And one of the ministers stood up on that platform and said, I want to I declare to you right now, to this younger generation, you are not the problem in America. You are its solution. Stand up and be that solution. I want to say to you, you're not the problem. Christian child of God, they can call you traditional, they can call you old school, they can call you stuck in history, but you're not the problem, you're the solution because he who lives inside of you. Start seeing yourself as that. Don't take the identity from the world that says you're the problem. The problem with the world is that mean, yeah, that might be mean Christians, but the authentic Christian is not the problem in the world. Okay, so he says, I better hurry, haven't I? We okay? And he answered and said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your fathers have, your house have, in that you have forsaken the commandment of the Lord and have followed the Baals. It's interesting. He said, you followed the Baals. He uses a plural thing right there, but if you do a study on Baal, the God, little g, Baal, Baal is noted as the fertility god. That's interesting that they're worshiping the god of fertility. And here were some expressions of his fertility. One expression was rain. Because when rain comes, crops begin to grow. So the ground becomes fertile if there's rain. And they're worshiping a God that's supposed to be the God of rain, but the superior God has said through one of his prophets, there will not be no rain until I say. You serve that God. You serve the God that is so much more superior. Here's the second thing. He's the God of the dew. The, Baal's one of the, the God of the dew. Meaning the morning, the morning dawn, the morning time, the dew that's left on the ground where the plants, even though there may not be rain, could absorb some amount of water that brought a freshness to the morning. And then finally, it was extraordinarily perverse. It was the fertility of life or sex, sex things. That's why the temple prostitutes uh, of, of Jezebel's day and so he says you've served them all the, he says the problem 
is that you, you don't know where the source of rain is, so you're worshiping something that can't bring you any type of rain to refresh you. You're worshiping a God in darkness, hoping a morning dew will be up on the ground, but you continue to walk in darkness. You're worshiping a God for the sake of pleasure, and you think that pleasure is only in the here now, in the, uh, in the expression of sexuality. He said, but I'm telling you, I'm here on assignment for the one true real living God. And, and this is a whole story that's going to end in rain. Check this one out. Check this one out. This is powerful. Man, this is powerful stuff. So, so skip on down and we're going to jump in. Right, now. We're going to skip the whole the, the battle on Mount Carmel. Let's go down to verse 41. Verse 41. He said, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink. Now he's... When I see this, I'm thinking, what? What does that mean? It kind of dawned on me. I think that this is God through Elijah giving Ahab another opportunity to start to operate in faith in God again. Because the whole thing has been about rain. The whole thing has been they, Obadiah and Ahab set out to go try to just find a little bit of water so that they won't have to start killing off more livestock. And then this showdown happens on Mount Carmel. And now here they are, and it's all as it comes to this, this closure of this chapter, at least. We find that Elijah is saying to Ahab, go eat and drink. For, now, now, you have to understand, again, it's in the context that r right after this incredible battle that ensues where he says... The God that answers by fire, let him be God. 450 prophets of Baal is destroyed and killed at that particular time. God has answered by fire. Other prophets were seized up on and destroyed at that particular time. And I personally believe that that king was humbled right there, right in front of everybody. And now the goodness of God is going to give him an opportunity to be able to go and make this thing right. But how do you know the influences in his life won't let him do it? The influence in his life will not let him do it. He, he could not, he, he would not break away from Jezebel. It eventually cost him his own life. There's demonic spirits that operate in the church that man has titled them the spirit of Jezebel. I shouldn't say man has titled it the spirit of Jezebel. The Bible has because you find out that there is a literal woman named Jezebel who eventually dies and the dogs lick her blood. But you turn over into the book of Revelation and you find her showing up again. She's a spirit. In that whole thing that I was giving you a minute ago about pulling hell up or pulling heaven down, do you understand how principalities get permission to rule over an area? It's that long-term participation with pulling hell up until a principality, you operating in the realm of participating with hell, giving legal access, if you will, a gateway. It's like opening a gateway to demonic forces that come and set up. So in Daniel, when you find that when, when, when the angel is sent to bring the message to Daniel about his breakthrough in prayer, he is withstood by what is called the prince of Persia. A principality, a demonic principality that had set up rule over there because of so many, so much of the Babylonians participating with demonic spirits and those demonic spirits setting up strongholds over an area, a region. You want to know why there's so much conflict in our lives right now? Because there's conflict in the governmental system of our country giving an access and a gateway for a principality to rule over our country. The only answer to that is the people that know how to pull a superior government down called the kingdom of heaven. Who has a God and a king named Jesus whose government there shall be no end to to pull his rule down and take authority over a, an inferior thing. I don't know if I need... Y'all, can we stay here today and just preach on this the rest of the day? Oh my goodness, it's so powerful. It's so powerful. Uh, so, so Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. Ah, let me back up. Let me back up. Then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink. For there is a sound of the abundance of rain. Now, man, I've preached that before in revivals. There's, I hear a sound of abundance of rain. That preach is good. It does. It's, it's beautiful. It's amazing. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. 
Look how the Lord, here's my note right here. Look how the Lord has turned this around. We still serve a God of a turnaround. When everything looked like it was against uh, 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 Elijah, God turned the entire thing around. Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel and he bowed down to the ground. Hey, that's the key right there. That's the key right there. He bowed down to the ground. He, prayer. Prayer. If I could ever teach you the power of the ability that comes through sim the simplicity of prayer. That thing that the devil tells you is a waste of time. That thing that the, that, that the devil tells you that you just, you just give your laundry list and be done. That thing that the enemy does so much to undermine is the one, one of the great keys to his demise. So he goes and he's praying, man, man, pray. That's why we do 21-day fast. That's why I love it. Y'all don't know this, man, but y'all know that there's been a group of ladies that meet here at 6 o'clock on every Sunday morning to pray. You understand that every Thursday there's a life group that meets here just to pray? You understand that there's reasons that we go on and talk about prayer and we have prayer lines and prayer lists and we create prayer lines for the people because here's what I know. It's not what I say that will help you. It's what you do with what I say that will help you. And what you're supposed to do is take it to God and pray about it. And pray it in until it becomes your identity. Amen? And when it becomes your identity, you then become more powerful because now you've got a revelation of Jehovah not just in your knowledge but bursting forth in your identity and who you are. A lot of people know about God, but they don't ever let him out and give identity to his goodness because all they wanted was a cranial understanding of him instead of praying that thing in until it becomes your identity and exploding an expression of who God is in your livelihood. You missed a good opportunity to shout. Maybe it's because I said it a little softer. Man, that's powerful stuff right there. So when he went up to the mountain, he says, he says, go up, look toward the sea. Or Elijah looks at his servant. He says, go and look toward the sea. So he went and looked, and he said, there's nothing. In other words, he's done prophesied. Hey, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. It's going to rain. Remember? Do you all know that, you, do you recognize that the latter day outpouring mentioned in Joel that talks about rain, the former rain and the latter rain. You do know that's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit during your and my time. Do you know that? Do you understand that? That that rain is not something so specifically literal, but it is a heavenly descending of the work of the Spirit of God upon humanity. It's the pouring out of the Spirit of God. Joel talks about it, the former rain and the latter rain, all in the same month. In other words, God would pour something out specifically, profoundly, and overwhelmingly from heaven in your, my, my time. So sometimes when you see rain in the scriptures, you have to understand its spiritual implication. And here he is saying, I hear the sound of something. And how many you know, it's not because he heard it with these ears. Hello. You know, in the book of Revelation, seven times... Revelation 2 and 3. These words are stated. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. I believe that Elijah could hear something in the realm of the Spirit that not just the average Joe could hear and see. So he does this. He sends out his servant. He says, go look toward the sea and come back and give me a report. You know how many times he does that? Seven times. Another capitalization on the seven. Had Ahab understood his seventh appointment, he could have brought a rain and a... Remember, drought happened because he said, you and your fathers did not honor the commandments of God. If you would have honored the commandments of God, we wouldn't even be in this mess. But he said, and, and I love how God does it, just a way to remind you. So he sent his servant out seven times. But on the seventh time, he only comes back with a little report that says, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. That's all he sees. All he sees. Yeah, let's read it. Let's read it. Let's read it. It's so good. It's so good. I, it, it's, it reads much better than I could ever preach it. So Elijah went out. And so he says, he says so go look. And he said, there's nothing. Seven times. And seven times he said, go again. 
Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud, small as a man's hand, rising out of the sea. So he said, go say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. You know what he's saying? You better go tell Ahab there's about to be something that's going to be poured out that not even his horses and chariots can get him through. And so he says, he says go tell him that, that the, before the rain stops you. And the Bible says, now it happened. In the meantime, somebody say in the meantime. Stand to your feet because we're going to end right here. It happened in the meantime. In the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and a wind. And a wind. And a wind. And a wind. How many know that the wind always is synonymous with the rain? Hello, there's wind synonymous with the rain. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that there suddenly became a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Because when rain gets ready to come, you'll always understand that it is predicated upon a wind. So you might not feel that right away as far as the liquid rain but it's wind is on the way. Can you say amen? When that wind began to blow in that room, there was a reception that happened with 120 people that went outside and started this thing that Jesus said he would start through them called the church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against. And now for 2,000 years, uh, through kingdoms, through governments, through trial, through persecution, through tests, through, through all kinds of annihilation, through martyrdom, through through hate, through bigotry. The church of Jesus Christ is still alive. Why? Because he'll always send the wind and he'll always send the rain. Can you say amen? He said, he said, he said, here's what he said. He said, the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he girded up his loins and he ran ahead of the entrance of Je uh, 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 the entrance of Jezreel. Now, you know what's significant about that story? The significance about that story to me in this very moment is the fact that the anointing comes up on this man so heavily and so strong. He, <laughs> you talk about Pentecostal. Huh? You talk about Pentecost. I mean, he, the spirit of the Lord, or I might would say in our 21st century, the spirit of, of Pauline Morris got up on him. Many of y'all don't know Pauline, but some of you do that's been with us in this journey. And sometimes in a preaching message like this, when it gets high, or sometimes when the anointing gets strong, she would jump up out of her seat, this little four-foot-nothing woman. You better watch yourself. You'd be worshiping the Lord, and there'd be this wind go by you. And you think, whoa, there's the wind of the Holy Ghost. No, it was Pauline, just a flat-out run, just shouting and praising. I'm talking 80 years old doing that, bro. I'm talking about she would cut a lap around the church, and I just want to join her. Oh, man, I'll catch you on lap number two, but let's, let's, let's do this thing. Because I think that's powerful because of the way the, the Lord begins to run. So when, 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 when God begins to turn everything around, that anointing sets upon him, we see the celebration begin to happen. Three quick things that I see in this story. One, tough times, trials, famine, and problems do come to all of our lives. Second thing that I see in this story is be faithful as a servant of God. God will bless you. But the final thing that I see, God will send an outpouring. And I say, Lord, send it. Send the rain. Send the rain. Send the rain.